On the 29th of September 1940, two Avril Anson aircraft of the Australian No. 2 Service Flying Training School were on a cross-country training flight. Whilst flying in close formation over the town of Brocklesby, New South Wales, and at a height of 3,000 feet, they collided whilst in a turn. The lives of the four aircrew, as well as those on the ground, seemed to be in immediate danger. But what transpired was an exceptional display of courage and airmanship that not only prevented any loss of life, but also saved the two aircraft involved. Royal Australian Air Force Station Forest Hill is located 452 kilometres southwest of Sydney in New South Wales, near the town of Wagga Wagga. During World War II, Wagga Wagga became a garrison town, with the creation of military bases at Kapuka, Urnquinty and Forest Hill. And the latter, Forest Hill, was home to the number two service flying training school. Formed as part of the Empire Air Training Scheme, pilots would graduate to the SFTS following basic flying training to undergo more advanced flying training techniques such as night flying, instrument flying, formation flying and cross-country navigation. The number two service flight training school at Forest Hill had been training pilots since the 29th of July 1940. The aircraft type used at the school was the British twin-engine Avro Anson. The Anson had originally been developed as the Avro 652 light airliner, entering commercial service with Imperial Airways on the 11th of March 1935, albeit only two aircraft were ever built. But it soon caught the eye of the British Air Ministry, who were on the hunt for a suitable maritime reconnaissance aircraft. A prototype for the Air Ministry was produced in the same month that its commercial sibling entered service, under the designation Avro 652A, and is suitably impressed. Just four months later, 174 aircraft were ordered, and the type was named Avro Anson in recognition of the 18th century Admiral of the Fleet, George Anson. At the outbreak of war, the Avro Anson was pressed straight into action with RAF Coastal Command in the maritime reconnaissance role as planned. But it wasn't long before it began to show limitations, particularly when compared against the larger aircraft and flying boats such as the short Sunderland. As a maritime aircraft, it was rapidly becoming obsolete. The adaptability of the Anson would, however, come to its rescue, and it showed itself to be a more than capable multi-engine aircrew trainer. And so, many Ansons were redeployed as part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and several found themselves in Australia at the number 2 Service Flight Training School, Forest Hill. 29th of September 1940, and a cross-country training flight is being prepared for two of the school's two-man crews. Avro Anson tail number Lima 9162 will be crewed by pilot leading aircraftman Jack Inglis Hewson, 19 years old, from Newcastle, and navigator leading aircraftman Hugh Gavin Fraser, 27 years old and from Melbourne. The second Anson, tail number November 4876, is piloted by leading aircraftman Leonard Graham Fuller, 22 years old, from Cootamundra and his navigator, 27-year-old leading aircraftman Ian Menzies Sinclair from Glen Innes. Their route will see them depart Forest Hill and fly southwest 74 nautical miles to Karoa, before turning and flying north 78 nautical miles to Narandera, finally turning southeast for the 55 nautical mile leg back to Forest Hill. Following takeoff, the two Ansons climbed out to an altitude of 3,000 feet and they set their course southwest for Karoa. Having flown a little over 50 nautical miles, the aircraft were in tight formation and were passing over the small town of Brocklesby. All was going well, until the formation began to make a turn. Fuller's Anson was positioned a little higher than the other, and as the formation banked, he lost sight of Hewson's Anson. The next thing Fuller realised was an almighty bang and jolt accompanied by a terrific grinding noise. He later said that the jolt was so great, I would have been tossed right out of my seat and away from the controls if I hadn't had my safety belt on. He looked over out of his side cockpit window, and he was horrified to see the crushed cockpit of Houston's Anson, and he realised that the two aircraft were locked together. 
The terrific grinding noise that he had heard was the sound of his propellers biting into the engine cowlings of the lower aircraft. And in the lower aircraft, Houston had badly injured his back when the above Anson's propeller had sliced through his fuselage. Despite this, he thrust his still turning engines to full power and locked his controls before giving the order to his navigator, Fraser, to bail out. Fuller, having seen the crushed cockpit just below him, feared the worst for Hewson, but was soon relieved to see him crawl out of his crippled aircraft and fall away, deploying his parachute as he did so. His thoughts then turned to his navigator, Sinclair, and he ordered him to bail out, which he did. Fuller now had a dilemma. Should he follow Sinclair out of his aircraft? It soon became apparent to Fuller that the two locked together Ansons were not tumbling out of the sky, but in fact were flying almost steady. Because Houston had pushed his throttles to full power and locked his controls, Fuller was in a sort of steady flight, although an unarrestable descent. His own engines had been rendered useless in the impact. With the combination of the lower Anson's engines and the upper Anson's control services meant he had a chance. He realised that bailing out would carry a serious risk of causing casualties on the ground in Brocklesby, and so he looked around for a suitable landing spot. He drew on his training for a forced landing situation. Land as close as possible to habitation or a farmhouse, and if possible, land into the wind. He spotted a farmhouse with a large paddock, and despite his aircraft being very heavy at the controls and the engines of the lower Anson beginning to fail, he carried out a couple of circuits to lose some of his height, and to determine his best approach. He then made a textbook emergency landing, putting the stacked Ansons onto its belly and sliding along the field for about 180 metres before coming to a rest. He had flown the two Ansons for approximately 8 kilometres, or 5 miles, from where the collision had actually taken place. Afterwards, LAC Fuller was lauded for his skill. His commanding officer, acting squadron leader Cooper, had referred to his choice of improvised runway as perfect, and that the landing that was carried out was a most wonderful effort. News of the accident soon spread internationally and thrust the small town of Brocklesby into the limelight. Fuller's bravery, quick thinking and flying skill had averted possible disaster by causing damage to Brocklesby or even potentially killing or seriously injuring people on the ground. He was also given credit for saving the two Avro Ansons. His aircraft, November 4876, was repaired and returned to flying service. Whilst Houston's aircraft, Lima 9162, was repaired but never regained airworthiness, instead becoming an instructional airframe. LEC Houston spent some time in hospital due to his back injury, but he returned to graduate from number 2 SFTS later in 1941. He went on to gain a commission, and following the war he was discharged as a flight lieutenant in 1946. LAC Sinclair also graduated and survived the war again gaining a commission and reaching the rank of flight lieutenant. LAC Fraser would make the journey to Great Britain and the RAF and he was posted to 206 Squadron as a commissioned officer, flying as a pilot officer based out of Aldergrove in Northern Ireland. He was tragically killed however along with his crew when his Lockheed Hudson collided with a tree and crashed on the 1st of January 1942. LAC Fuller was promoted to sergeant soon after his successful forced landing, and he graduated number 2 SFTS in October of 1940. He received a commendation from the Australian Air Board, citing his presence of mind, courage, determination in landing the locked Ansons without serious damage to the aircraft under difficult conditions. Sergeant Fuller went on to serve on the front line for the Royal Australian Air Force before being posted to the RAF flying Wellington bombers for No. 37 Squadron. Following a bombing raid over the Italian port of Palermo on the 2nd of March 1942, he was decorated with the Distinguished Flying Medal and was commissioned into the officer ranks in September of 1942. He returned to Australia and was posted to Sale, Victoria, following being assigned to instructor duties for the No. 1 Operational Training Unit in 1943. Tragically, however, in 1944, whilst riding his bicycle in Sale, he was hit by a bus and he was killed. 
The story of Leonard Fuller's actions has not been forgotten, and not just within the archives of the Royal Australian Air Force. The town and the people of Brocklesby, New South Wales, remember his heroic actions of that day in sparing their town a potential disaster. And in 1990, on the 50th anniversary, they erected a marker on the site of the crash landing. And on the 26th of January 2007, during Australia Day celebrations, a permanent memorial of an Avro Anson engine was unveiled. Thanks very much for watching. Please take a moment to hit the like button and consider subscribing.